Okay, so we are <laughs> starting again uh, with these videos in which uh, what I'm trying to do is to share with all of you teachers of meditation from around the world how we have put together the framework of the teachings uh, that Guruji gave us and how we teach them together with the techniques and everything else that has been taught. Now, as I told you the, the first day or in the first video, everything is based in the structure of one day. Now, this attention in the structure of one day, in fact, you can find it in all the different spiritual traditions. You can find it in Buddhism, you can find it in Hinduism, and in, in the Islam, in, you name it, uh, in the Jews. The, the focus on the day you have to live, the focus of being aware here and now, somehow. Uh, in our own tradition and what we do when we do these courses, we make references to other traditions. So we somehow make good our emblem. And our emblem shows all the different spiritual traditions. Uh, you know, Buddhism, Christianism, Hinduism, Ju Judaism, uh, Zoroastrism, Confucianism, Islam. Taoism and the a spiral of evolution which uh, really makes reference to the rest of them or to the quest for the truth that is part of the evolutionary path. Because the evolutionary path at the end of the day is a kind of quest for the truth uh, and we are uh, forms of life in, in an evolution process. In fact, to understand the, the mind, that is what we are going to speak about today, you need to understand evolution. But I am going to leave that topic for the next video, because today we are going to speak about the mind straight away. <laughs> in any case, everything you know starts in, you, you know, we take reference in one day, and this is also in our spiritual tradition, which is the Christian tradition. Uh, all of you, or most of you at least, have been raised in the Western countries in the Christian tradition. And in the Christian tradition, <coughs> I brought this so that I can read it. If I speak in Spanish, I normally paraphrase it, but as I am speaking in English, I will just read it, and it's Matthew chapter 6, uh, from 26 to 34. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your he heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And there comes the phrase, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. 
which is basically, Guruji used to say this in, with many examples, like, uh, take care of the pennies and the pounds will be will take care of themselves or in dollars take care of the cents and the dollars will take care of themselves which is take care of your day and tomorrow will take care of itself so concentrate yourself in the day you have to live and in the day you have to live we have something very important which is thought so we have this memory back that we project in the screen of our mind when we wake up in the mornings and we have a day to live and then the thought process starts now this past this past that is in our memory back and it's our memories and the people that are part of our lives and you know from your mother your friend your working acquaintance or you name it all the people your interpretation of your circumstances you have to take care that the interpretation your memory back does of your circumstances is one thing when you wake up you have an idea of what your circumstances are and another thing is what your circumstances really are which is the day you have to live that is your real authentic circumstances and those are the circumstances that you have to deal with and you have no other circumstances to deal with but the circumstances you have to live today so the circumstances you project in the screen of your mind and the real circumstances the actual circumstances that you have to live are two different things that's why Guruji used to use the word, the word actuality because what you consider to be real is this but what is actual is the day you have to live now because you think and we are dealing today with thoughts and the mind Now, because you think, it's not that it is wrong, but because you think that there is something wrong in your circumstances, in your circumstances as you project them in your mind, in the sense that it's not your circumstances today, but the idea you have of your circumstances, so because you normally think that there is something wrong in your circumstances as you project the reality of your circumstances in the screen of your mind which is not real but it is what you consider real you say oh this is bad you know I I don't have a company and I want company or I don't have money and I want money or I am not enlightened and I want to be enlightened <laughs> it, it can be any stupidity like this three or any other that you can imagine so then you project this idea of your circumstances into an hypothetical future which is where you want to take this reality between quotations you want to take this reality to a future and this obviously includes you know all your desires and you know frustrations you name it there are lots of things here that make you create this projection of this past into a future now because when we teach we want to because you imagine that in the future the things are going to be better uh, well because you for example you wake up and, uh, and you are uh, uh, in your imagination of your circumstances you you say i cannot be happy if i don't have a couple if i don't 
find a couple, for example, if I don't have, uh, you know, a husband or a wife, and then you, uh, you immediately project this past into a future. In other words, you are desiring somehow to have a couple and these energies of those desires, etc., is going to uh, uh, energize the thought processes and all the inner conversations that you have in your mind uh, that will go from, oh, I am so miserable because I don't have a couple to whatever y you want to name it. In other words, you say this is wrong and everything will be okay when I have a couple. Because when I have a couple, everything will be okay. And now things are not okay because I don't have a couple. In the meantime, in your circumstances, you might be meeting with this person in the coffee shop. Uh, but you are so worried about this that you will not be even be aware of him. <laughs> so, that's what I'm trying to say. Now, because we, we try to relate what we explain with all the different traditions, you know, we use references to Buddhism, to Christianism, to Judaism, to Taoism, to Islam, to anything necessary or anything adequate to philosophy, etc. For example, in, in Buddhism, we have the Four Noble Truths. The first noble truth, I mean, at the end of the day, why do we meditate? Why do we engage in a spiritual practice? We engage in a spiritual practice because we suffer. We engage in a spiritual practice because we suffer and we think that the spiritual practice will help us uh, overcome the, the suffering that we are experiencing. Uh, people might think, no, I engage in a, a spiritual discipline because I want to find truth. Well, the reality is that you suffer because you think you don't have the truth and then you engage in a spiritual discipline because you suffer because, you know, you don't see God, you know. So it is always because you suffer. You might be suffering because you don't have a partner or a couple or you might be suffering because you don't have money or because you have some sort of physical illness or because uh, you want to see God and you don't see God, but it is because you suffer. So Buddhism, the four noble truths of Buddhism say, one, the first noble truth is man suffers. which is an obvious thing. Because spiritual teachings always deal with very obvious things, with things that any person can relate to. It is not a matter of academics. It is not a matter of studying books. It is not a matter, it's a matter of being human, fully, fully human. So the first noble truth is that man suffers the second noble truth is that the cause of this suffering, the, 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 the source of this suffering, the cause of this suffering is Dukkha. Now Dukkha has been translated as desire, but it is not desire. Dukkha is this movement in, in the mind, the movement that when you project your memories in the screen of your mind, makes a judgment about the situation and then through this judgment of the situation considers that something is wrong and then projects that to the future which includes desires but it includes frustrations it includes many things that you somehow hunker or crave for this imagined self in a future which is not the actual self and then you crave for it and then that is dukkha. That is the real meaning 
of Dukkha. Now, the third noble truth is that the, this, this problem has a solution. I mean, it is not a situation where there is no solution. As you know, the story of Buddha is this prince, Siddhartha, that had everything, women, beauty, intelligence, you name it, and he was living in this palace and su suddenly left the palace and found, you know, illness and the suffering, the, the, the experience of suffering. And then he started this quest to find how, what is the solution to the suffering man. And in that quest he had lots of experiences and this, that, the other, and then he came out with his teachings when he found out. So the third noble truth is that there is a solution and the fourth noble truth is that the solution is the eightfold path. The eightfold path. Well, the eightfold path, as any other spiritual path, fits perfectly in the scheme of a day, which is the eightfold path will tell you about uh, mm, right concentration or right meditation. I think the word is samatha. Uh, it will tell you about right mindfulness, right attention. It will tell you about right wisdom, some understanding or, of what this is all about, uh, the right action, so the action which you know you uh, perform without desiring of the results of the action, the right thought, you know, and the right feelings or compassion. At the end of the day, you know, it, it every spiritual path fits in the discipline you have to apply for one day. And we explain the spiritual path not from the Buddhist point of view or from the Christian point of view or from you name it point of view. We explain the essence of that path so that anyone that understands the essence of, one pa of that path then will be able to understand the Christian path, the Buddhist path, the Hindu path. That is why we have this saying that if you are a Buddhist and you follow our method, you will become a better Buddhist. If you are a Christian and you follow our method, you will become a better Christian. And if you are an atheist and follow our method, you will become a better person. Because it has nothing to do with the cultural background, it has to do with the essence of the discipline and how it works and why is it good for society to practice these disciplines? So, uh, let me continue then. So, this is a little bit the situation. We wake up, we have this mechanism working. This mechanism working is Dukkha. Dukkha is what creates the suffering. We have our real actuality, which is our circumstances, our imagined reality that projects itself to the future and we have the discipline that we are going to apply uh, to overcome the situation. Now part of the discipline is proper wisdom or correct wisdom. In other words, understanding certain concepts. And one of the concepts that one has to understand, one of the understandings that is necessary is understanding how the mind works and how thought works and what kinds of thoughts are there, etc., etc. Now, when you understand something, you kind of uh, have creative power over that thing that you understand. If you understand, for example, the electromagnetic field, then you can build a radio or a television or a mobile phone. You can apply your creative power to use that energy of nature that you understand to create new things. So you become an owner of that energy instead of that energy being your owner. 
And the same thing happens with the mind, with thought. If you understand the mind and you understand thought, you are able to apply your creative power to the mind and to thought, and then create new things through the exercising or of your creative power, which is the divinity within you, which is the, the, crea the creation process. We were looking this this morning in a satsang, if you might remember, from manifestation comes creation. First goes manifestation, and then that creative power cre creates new forms, one after the other, through, a, through the evolutionary process, till you arrive to the person you are today. Now, the person you are today has a mind, so we are going to look at the mind. And first, we are going to look at the different kind of thought patterns that the mind can engage with. And here we also, e or we always introduce, you know, the scientific findings about the mind and thought and consciousness, etc., etc. Because we want to use a language which is acceptable today, and because there are many things that uh, come from uh, psychology and neurobiology and the different uh, consciousness disciplines that are today studied in different universities, which are good thoughts, which are good ideas that can be conjoined and can be used uh, to uh, help understand uh, what the mind and thought is all about. So, according to neurobiology, there are four kinds of thoughts. Uh, four kinds of thoughts that, you know, create a different pattern in the uh, uh, NRAs and the electroencephalograms or, and all the measurements that neurobiologists today do. So, there is the creative creative pattern. The creative pattern is when the mind is engaged in something creative. It could be, you know, doing a painting and is part what, of what we were taught to paint, to sing. It, it might be singing a song. It might be writing a poem. It might be planning your vacations. Or it might be planning your term, your sales for the term that you have to engage in. So when you are using your mind to create something new, and this something new can be a song, a poem, or a vacation planning. When the, main, the mind is in a creative state, <coughs> and you engage, and the mind gets completely engaged in the creative state, you know, uh, time kinds of, you don't perceive the, 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 the length of time because you are so engaged in, in the creativity you are doing. You are just kind of flowing in thought and that kind of thought does not produce any suffering because it is not involved in dukkha. It's involved in other patterns. It's not a past projected into a future. It is another kind of thought, which is the creative thought. So that is one kind of thought that you have. The second kind of thought that uh, exists is the contemplative. Contemplative thought. Now, there are many uh, video satsangs recorded and audio satsangs recorded about contemplation. But contemplation basically is when your mind is flowing uh, without interruption uh, with, to, to, with something. So there is something that you allow your mind to flow and contemplate. For example, you can contemplate the, the dawn of the sun, or you, be, you can be contemplating the sunset, and then you are there, and you sit down, 
and you are contemplating the sunset. You just allow your mind to contemplate all the different colors, the noises, the, the how the, as the night comes, you know, the noises go less and less and, and the air. So you are contemplating, you are letting your mind flow in the contemplation of this sunset. You can contemplate a poem you are reading. You can contemplate a song you are listening. Most of the people have very limited ability to contemplate, which means that the majority of people are not able to sit down to contemplate their favorite song without being interrupted by thoughts that come, oh, I have to do the shopping, no, while you are listening the song. You are not you are not in a position where you just let the mind flow through the object of your contemplation. So that is the contemplative thought, the creative thought. Now, the other state of the mind is the meditative state. I'm not going to explain this state because all of you are meditators <laughs> and you know more than enough by your own experience, what is the meditative state. But neither the creative thought or the contemplative thought or the meditative thought um, produces any problems within you. The fourth state is what the neurobiologists called the default mode networking. Which means that by default, like a computer, your mind, your brain, when, wakes, when it wakes up in the morning, by default is in this state. And this state is the conversations of the mind. Which means that when you wake up, you start having conversations with all sorts of people which means that if you're thinking about your family relationships, you might be, you know, having a, while you shower, you might be having a conversation with your mother, with your imagined mother. Or if you think about work, you might having a conversation with your colleague or with your boss and so on and so forth. You keep talking all the time. Now, this is what creates problems. This is the problematic thought. Because this thought is far from being wise. It's just a mechanism of the projected identity that inherits the animal instincts of perpetuation and self-survival, and it is this mechanism projecting to the future, trying to perpetuate itself and to survive, because he thinks he is the real thing. And, you know, the actual thing that it has in front of him passes unnoticed to him. That's why John Lennon used to say that life is that that passes in front of you while you are busy with another thing. <laughs> so this is the default mode networking. Now, all these conversations, uh, the minute you put your attention into them, are full with lies. So you might be, you know, having a shower and telling your mother in the shower, no, mommy, I am not smoking anymore. But, you know, at, at the same time, you are thinking about leaving the shower dressing to go and buy a packet of cigarettes. <laughs> or it can be a manipulative thought where you are kind of manipulating the image you have of the other person to obtain something from the other person. 
or it could be a projection of yourself uh, in what you are not, you know, so, you know, for example, if you are a man and you are talking with this woman in your mind and you are attracted to this woman, you might me you might be in your inner conversation uh, projecting yourself as a sort of superman or james bond or you name it and the same goes otherwise if it is a woman or so a projection of yourself of that description and then it is filled with judgments complaints etc etc in other words it's not a wise thought. It's not wisdom. Now, the important thing is, in the scope of the 16 hours of any day of your life, you have to ask yourself, how much of these 16 hours I am thinking crea creatively? How, of, of, a, of an average day, how many hours I am exercising creative thought? You know, depends. <laughs> Most of people, I tell you, we will have to say, well, pff, maybe a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> How much time your thought is in a contemplative state? Yes. Depends. <laughs> If you go a lot to the opera and you love the opera, probably a little bit more because you contemplate an opera also or you contemplate a painting or you name it. If you are a painter or are in the creative arts or you might have a little bit more, a, a, a higher average, but normally very low. How much time are you me meditating? Well, if you meditate, more or less an hour a day. So the rest, the rest of the time, you are in the, in the default mode networking mechanism, which is the mechanism that generates dukkha, which is the responsible of your experience of suffering. So dealing with thoughts is a very important part of the spiritual path, because... <coughs> The day is made out of the actions, of the thoughts, and of the feelings. And as we will get little by little, all these three things are perfectly interrelated and create a whole system. Good. So now what we want to uh, see is get an understanding of how the mind works. Now. To explain the mind, we are going to use several schemes of the mind, several ideograms of the mind, that will help us understand how all this thing works. And I'm going to start with... Uh, as I said before, to understand well how the mind came about to begin with, we need to study the process of evolution. But uh, without taking for granted that the evolution has happened, you are here with a mind today. And if you are here with a mind today, basically we can use several, I don't know if the word in English is ideogram, but is of idea and a graphic. So a graphic that represents an idea. It, it's not that the mind is like this. Uh, we use this graphic to represent an idea. So this is a square, and this is what we are going to call, this square is going to, is what, what we are going to call the individualized mind. I mean, the mind, that you experience in this lifetime. Now, the individualized mind is in front of the universe.
and has something here in the back which I am not going to get into it until we get uh, we we do the evolution part of the story but for you to get an idea this is the part where you know Guruji used to paint these arrows like this uh, which was kind of the light the light of the mind or the supraconscious mind Now, the mind is connected to the universe by two channels, an input and an output. Now, these two channels in yoga, they have a name, which is the Ida and the Pingala, which means that you receive the input through Ida and you act over the universe through Pingala. This part of the mind the in Sanskrit is called Manas and this is what neurobiologists call the senso motor system. I really don't know if the word in English is sense of motor, but the senses and the muscles. So you receive the input of the universe through the senses and you act back to the universe through your muscles. So this is the part of the brain that deals with the senses and the muscles. Uh, any action you perform that changes this universe, that you act over this universe, you perform it moving your muscles. It might be writing a letter, but you have to move your muscles. Uh, and everything you perceive comes from your senses. Uh, you can be using a telescope, but at the end of the story are the senses. So the senses bring the information in, and with the muscles, we act, uh, we act over this universe, no? So in this universe, you know, in the, in the far end, in the sky, you have all the stars and all the galaxies, but in, in nearby, you have your daily circumstances, but all the universe is there, in other words. So, an event happens, uh, out there and then gets the information gets through the senses to this other part of the mind which is the memory box here is good to use an example I always use this this example but you could use any other example say for example that you are a woman uh, or you are a man, it, it's the same. You are a woman or a man and you are walking in this street. Uh, and then in the street opposite to you, so in the other side of the street and coming down is your boyfriend or girlfriend walking hand by hand with another girl or boy you know, uh, with an aspect of having a great time. So you receive all that information is composed in the organs of the senses. And then it goes to the memory box, which basically recognizes what previous, previous experiences, so this event activates previous experiences that make you know the event. So, for example, that is my boyfriend. And if you were a woman, you might say, you might think, and that bitch, <laughs> who the hell is that bitch? <laughs> uh, so you make a recognition, you recognize her as a bitch. And then your boyfriend 
you know, might have other memories attached to it. And then there might be certain patterns and structures of other memories that are activated also, but are not conscious to your mind. So there are some of the things that are activated in the memory. You are conscious of it. Some of the information that becomes part of this activated package of information, you are not conscious of it. Uh, the kind of recognition you do of any event depends directly of previous experiences that you have. For example, if you are an American or an English woman uh, or a Spanish woman for that matter, uh, you might recognize the other woman as a bitch. <laughs> or, but if you are Muslim, you know, and you live in Jeddah and uh, you have a husband that already has two wives, well, you might recognize her as, look, maybe the third wife is coming. <laughs> so it depends, it depends on the, the, the memories that are activated by this event are completely dependent on previous experiences, previous impressions in your mind. So in other words, the event activates what we could call a package of information of which you might have a consciousness of some of these memories and not conscious of some of the underlying memories, impressions or structures that are part of the same kind of uh, uh, energy or, or they have the same quality as this event, no? So this package of information that is activated by the event in the memory box is sent to two places. This place of the mind and this place of the mind. Now, the Hindus called this place Ahankara. Ahankanda. But the word you know, we could use for that is identity. Now, Ahankara is the part of the, of the, of the mind that eventually gives the order to the muscles to move. So it is a, a very closely related to your identity, because your identity is very closely related to your body. You are identified essentially and to begin with, with your body. It is going to be your body, the body that is going to cross the street and you know... <laughs> <laughs> send the bitch to <laughs> the other side of the street, or it's going to be your body, the body that you know contracts and and hide so that you are not seen. The, the, the movement of the muscles define the identity. So here, in Ahankara, what you have is all the identification processes, which is kind of the, a selection of memories, of memories, desires, etc., that define your identity. This is Ahankara. This part of the mind is called Buddhi. Now, Buddhi is the part of the mind that is nearer to the light of the mind. In fact, Buddha comes from the word Buddhi. The word that we would use in, in a Western world for Buddhi would be the intellect. You know, the intellect is the light of the mind. The intellect is the light of the mind. That's, that's why in the illustration process in the 18th century, you know, they said the century of lights, no? El siglo de las luces. I don't know how you say that in English. I suppose it's the century of lights or of enlightenment or whatever you call it. 
the intellect, you know, the giving, giving the, the putting the emphasis in the intellect. Now, the intellect in the, in the most superficial area of the intellect, what you do is the analysis of the pros and cons of a situation. But there is more to the intellect because the intellect is in touch with the light of the superconscious mind. Let me introduce this here, you know, in the same way that in the universe there is light, you have the sun, the stars, and you name it, and then you, through that light, you become aware of the universe. In the same way there is a universe, a material universe, there is a universe, a mind universe, a universe of information, and there is light also. And this is the Ida, this is the Pingala, and this is what in yoga is called Shushumna. So, this package of information the, that is activated by this event goes to Buddhi, where Buddhi analyzes the pros and cons of the situation in the example, the boyfriend, the this, the that, the other sends the information of that analysis to the identity that can require more information to the memory so the memory might be looking for some other data it could be unconscious, subconscious or consciously and sending it again to Buddhi for an analysis and so on and so forth so this goes back and forth several times till this uh, kind of situation is solved by itself and it's solved through an order to the muscles which determine a behavior because behavior is the very minute you move your muscles to speak to run to whatever so what why you do you know and why your behavior is one or another for the same event? Well, it depends what kind of memories or samskaras or impressions activate the event, what kind of light is here to make this analysis properly, and what kind of identity constraints are there in your identifications this is solved by itself. In other words, there is no what we could call <coughs> choice for you. This is going to <coughs> sort out itself like, like this falls down when I throw it because it is determined to do that. The freedom of yourself has nothing to do with how this functioning sorts out itself. Okay? Is, is this... Did yeah, it's easy now, but uh, it's supposing uh, <coughs> with different kind of intellect, you can decide it in different ways. Well, it's exactly. Same, it depends how much light is there coming in so that you can see more or less of the situation. What are the previous impressions that are activated by this event and what kind of identifications you have it, depending on what is the combination of things this response in one way or in another but this response it depends on these things it is if you would put it in mach mathematics the behavior is function of the amount of light uh, the impressions, the previous impressions, and the identifications. Impressions and the identifications. So, it depends how, how are these variables. These, but this, this will be very mathematical. If there is more light, it will give another uh, result. If there is different impressions, it will give another result. If there is a different identity with the same impression, the same in light, it will give another behavior, and so on and so forth. Yeah. What I want to say is 
say is because maybe you can work in your intellect, no? To have another resource. Well, that is why we work in our light. Okay, so because the essence of the intellect is the light, is that you see, that you become aware, <laughs> that you understand in a holistic way the situation. Okay, so now how, how this mechanism comes to uh, become this mechanism? Now, <clears throat> when you come to this life, I mean, at the end of the day, you come to this life and you are born, this is the moment zero, and then you start living one day, another day, another day, and so on and so forth, till this is the end, no, well, it's zero, one, I don't know, <laughs> whatever, you know, it's one day after another, and each of the days you gather new impressions that change the mechanism a little bit, that wakes up the next day, gathers new impressions, change the mechanism a little bit, and it's like a process of evolution. You could say that e each day is like a life, is the life of the mechanism for that day. And until you don't become free of the mechanism, you are subject to reincarnation in another day, <laughs> and you wake up the next day with the same problems, <laughs> in other words. Anyhow, so you are born, but when you are born in this moment, there are certain tendencies. And these tendencies is like, imagine that this, which we could call the mind, the universal mind, and this will be better understood when I explain evolution, uh, but it, it's like an ocean. So, you know, there are currents here, you know, currents that, you know, push, push this. So when you are born, there is a push. Um, there is a push that pushed you to walk. Uh, there is a push that pushed you to speak. There is a push that pushes you to wake up every morning. That push that is pushing you has been pushing the universe since it started. And you know, through the process of evolution, has been learning lots of things through many, many experiences, life after lifetime, and we will explain this with the evolution part of the thing, but you are born with this push which represents this push, this energy that is pushing, you know, um, somehow is the sum totality of what you have learned and it includes in the kind of kind of push it is, what you need to learn. So say you are born with a tendency to complain, no, and to cry. You are born with a tendency, you are a, a baby that uh, cries all the time. You, you are with a tendency of complaining. So the first thing you complain is that you know you are in your bed and uh, you you hear the door no banging and you get a little bit scared and y you cry and you feel a little bit bad and you cry and it is dark and you cry and you have this this 
these babies that cry a lot. They are babies that cry less, babies that cry more. So you, la you, you are born with that tendency and you are born in a family with a mother that is hyperprotective. So she, you know, you, hears you cry and will take you and, uh, you know, care you and you will feel her skin and everything and you get comforted, no? And then, you know, you cry again and your mother is there and you cry again and your mother is there and you, you, you know, you, you go from zero to three years, you know, you keep, you know, crying and getting the attention, crying and getting the attention. And so basically you are receiving impressions of the door slamming or the darkness of the room and these impressions are creating a reaction and then you receive a reaction of the environment that creates a further impression and you create like a path many times repeated so you get used to that when you cry you are taken care of this goes till you are three years old but when you are three years old they take you to infant school now in infant school the teacher in charge or the teachers in charge are not so hyperprotective. Say that they are fed up with children. <laughs> and so you are there with other children, something happens, you cry because you know you, uh, you have created this path already and you have started to create an identity which is based that when I cry I am being taken care of. So this impression is part of this information becomes part of your identity. Although the identity at three years old is still just starting to be formed, but it is starting. Children start lying at three years old. So an identity is built upon lies, upon lies, upon lies, because you start lying at three years old. When you are a teenager, you don't stop lying. And on those foundations, you have built your identity, the identity you have of yourself being someone no so this is this is a construction um, built upon lies maybe it would be a little bit wrong to say like the trump's presidency but <laughs> i'm going to say it i cannot stop myself <laughs> now forget about that we are not in politics we think that everybody is okay except for Trump. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I was just joking, eh? I was just joking to my American <laughs> friends that like Trump. Um, so anyhow, you go to the school and then uh, you are with other children and there is other children there in your class that uh, were born with a very similar tendency of you, so complaining all the time, a crying baby, but they were born to a mother, because you know, and we will see how this is determined, why you are born to one mother or to another, depending what you need to learn, but there is another girl there in class that is born to another mother that is not so hyperprotective, that is a mother that, you know, is fed up with her child and you know doesn't care a damn of when you cry so if you cry when you started crying when you were a baby you were left in the couch crying till you were tired of crying and then you stopped crying so you have the same tendency or a very similar tendency the the path that is created is different and because you don't receive attention and you are claiming for attention, this mechanism develops uh, other uh, structures which are different. Mm? But what happens is when you are in infant school, then, and you know this girl, the, the crying girl, is in the class where the other crying girl is, but they have, you know, opposite mother, one is a positive and another is a negative, then this energy, which is positive, negative, get attract each other. And so 
the girl that is crying is immediately taken care by the girl that used to cry and was never taken care by his mother. And she adopts the position of the mother uh, and this is something that happens automatically. So, you know, birds of a feather flock together, in other words. <laughs> Which means, and then, you know, she becomes your friend in the infant school, and then you go to primary school, and all these things continue developing, but the environment that is being created around you, and the impressions that the environment is creating, because you are reacting to the environment since you are born, the environment and the impressions is like something that grows together. So, you know, the crying girl with the, you know, hyperprotective mother uh, surrounds herself of the crying girl with the mother that cares a damn for her. And then this creates kind of a, a mirror. So, in other words, all these impressions that will constitute the base of your memory in this lifetime and the circumstances that create these impressions, they grow together. It's not something that grows separately. So, in fact, the circumstances you are in and the impressions you have, so what you are with respect of this memory back is one the mirror of the other that is why you either see yourself in a mirror when you look outside or see god when you can see beyond these mechanisms so uh, i don't know how much time i've been speaking now but i don't want to be very heavy so it is what, how many time, I it doesn't say here. Oh, yeah, it says, so it's, it's an hour and 20 minutes now, more than enough for a video. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I leave it here, and of course thoughts, the mind has a lot to be looked at, and uh, we will be uh, going through all these things in the next coming videos. <laughs> Thank you very much. Namaste. <laughs> bueno, pues venga. Esto lo apagamos ahora. Me he dado cuenta, no pasa nada que quería interrumpir. Yo, bueno, sí. voy a cortar que no hemos bajado la, la 